Good morning and welcome. Today we have our friend Rick Bra here to talk about labor management. Um, I do have a little bit of housekeeping while everybody's coming in. Uh, yes, we are recording today's webinar. We will have it up on our website later on today, along with his slides. And you can also find it wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for the Washington Hospitality Industry Podcast. Um, if you have any questions today, go ahead and type them in the Q&A section below, and we can answer them on air. And finally, we need to give a special thank you to our sponsor, Ad sponsor Adesso. If you'd like more information on the employee retention tax credit, visit our website at wahospitality.org. And now, here's Rick. Good morning, Rick. All right. Good morning, everybody. So we're in a new era with the same challenging labor issues that we've had uh, since the beginning of time. So typical ways that we lose money uh, in labor is we overstaff. That one's pretty easy. Typically, it's the first and the last hour of each shift. We understaff. That costs you sales at the table. We have many complexity that's too hard for the kitchen to execute on a timely basis. It drags out the, the ticket times. Employee turnover is extremely expensive, and that's something that we can discuss because I think if we can get over that hump of uh, trying to pay competitively and pay people what they're, you know, what, what they need to stick around, I think we can change the model a little bit. Low employee productivity, overtime, which you should use as a benefit and not a weapon against yourself. Absenteeism, slow guest turnover, layout of physical facilities, and it goes on and on and on. I could have spent the whole day just talking about the things and the ways that we lose money managing labor. So where are we at? in the labor force. So I remember speaking to somebody over the last couple of months that literally told me that our busser from last night is the new GM of another restaurant. And it wasn't like it was a slouch restaurant and that this guy was literally has no management experience and became the GM of a restaurant that probably does two and a half to three million. So it's a shocking time that we're at. People are scrambling for talent. Uh, but they they may be experienced with inexperienced, but they're intelligent. So they want to make more money and have bigger expectations. It's astonishing, uh, pre-pandemic to post-pandemic, how much we're paying both for managers and in particular um, back of the house staff. So what was uh, people crying for fifteen dollars an hour uh, to be a dishwasher now want twenty one. So things have dramatically changed in the marketplace more money and they wanna be managed better, frankly. So we have to always remember that every person that works in the business represents the brand of the business from door to door. That starts with the person that parks your car, you have ballet, all the way through to walking out to the thank you. So every person, we have to make sure that we are, are uh, really driving home the brand myth to people and the type of service that you expect so clarifying expectations is one of the top things that you need to do. And we're in this kind of whole uh, stage of starting over, I would say, even though we're you know a good year and a half in from the pandemic. So we have to be in the directing stage versus guiding. We can't expect that people know what they uh, should be doing. And that's where we get to this management work. The hardest work's really ahead. And, and when I grew up, we had a management model that talked about planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. And my observation was always, we're really good about staffing, directing, and controlling, and really poor about planning and organizing. And planning is really having that business out in front of you. And that's the key to running a successful restaurant is always be looking forward, use behind you for the lessons, but always be looking forward and planning. That's the science of running restaurants. And it really comes down to getting the right people in the right place, doing the right work at the right time. And the last piece on there is development within. We are running tighter and tighter on talent at the management level. Uh, and a lot of times when we bring in management from outside, it doesn't work out. So we really need to be developing people from within and helping them get from point A to point B into the management ranks or even being really strong team members, but we have to develop from within which really starts with engagement. So the US employee engagement trend in the upper uh, green chart up there, you can see that it's been growing since about 2000, which is a little bit surprising to me. 
took a dip in 2005. Then it kind of uh, started working its way up. And we're at 33%. I looked at some of my old work that I did you know, earlier in the 2000, 2010. We're sitting about 27%. So that's actually growing. It's dropped off somewhat uh, from 2020 because I think a lot of people were working from home um, and basically you know, they felt really engaged. Uh, during the beginning part of the pandemic, and then it kind of drew out and became less engaged. Uh, the actively disengaged people, those are the dangerous ones. They work against your culture. So we used to hover around 20%. That's down to about 16, but you can see that it's going back up again. Uh, people are getting a little bit um, grumpier about work. So when we talk about engagement, we talk about an employee's willingness to freely give this discretionary effort. So are they gonna give it to you freely? And then it's really being capable of what, what you're doing versus what you're willing to do. So can do, will do. I can do it and I'm capable of doing it. So if you look at the uh, uh, bell curve, you can see that on the left-hand side, you have actively disengaged. On the right-hand side, you have, have actively engaged. Then you have somewhat disengaged and somewhat engaged um, on um, both sides there. So the actively disengaged people give you a half a day of work for a full day of pay. The actively engaged people give you a day and a half of work for a full day of pay. So they give you three times the amount of work than somebody that's actively disengaged. Most people, I would say, in the workforce are kind of hovering in that middle, somewhat disengaged, somewhat engaged kind of go back and forth and you can see you get two thirds of a day out of one side of the, of, uh, the engagement and you get a full day on the other side. So what happens is that that grows that um, customer passion and loyalty, the more engaged your crew members are. So we gotta make sure that people are psyched up from the minute that they come in the door to the minute they go away uh, back home. So you can see that 300% more productive than an actively disengaged person. That's why the people that work really hard and they're your superstars, I love to reward with overtime because you're paying them time and a half and you're getting a day and a half of work out of them for a full day of pay. So even on the incremental that you're paying time and a half, you've still won overall throughout the entire day. So I love to reward people that are really hard workers and kick, they just, they just get stuff done. They just kick butt. And we all know those people. And those are the people you want to reward with overtime particularly in the kitchen. So this last piece down here is something that uh, a gentleman named Corey McKenzie laid out during a meeting that I had with one of our clients. And he talked about what people want today is predictability, consistency, and stability. And by predictability, it's really a predictable workplace where I'm going to work. And consistency, they're really looking for consistent work and consistent norms and standards. And then stability is, what happens when you know everything hits the fan and um, it's very, very stressful here. We've all worked with managers that we couldn't count on. What people look for today is who's gonna lead me through the storm because restaurant business is not easy. It's it really busy and then it slows down and it gets really busy again. And so they want leadership that's really stable. They, they want leadership that they can count on when when things are falling apart, they can keep it together and put it together. And that's the kind of stability that they're working for. And out of that, it creates a safe workplace for them where they can perform really well at a really high level. So I think it's a great model to create a predictable workplace that's consistent with norms and standards and is stable from decision-making standpoint and from uh, an emotional standpoint. A lot of fun you can create by having that model in place. So we also have to time, come to the point of providing extra touches. Now we're back to that point where really we've dropped off. We looked at that more frequent recognition is critical for the U.S. employee engagement. So in the last seven days, and this is part of the Gallup Q12, and they have got it right on their site. You know, look at those statistics every month. So you can see they're all the way up to February, even though it's a few months behind, it's lagging. It's still very good data to give us an indication of where we're at. So in the last seven days, I received recognition or praise for doing good work. About 30% uh, agree. You can see all the way back in 2007, we were probably at 26, 27%. So that's actually come up a little bit, but definitely not at the peak of 2020. 
um, which you know is is in the pandemic, and you see 2021 as well. Uh, people felt like that they uh, were receiving a little bit more recognition than they are today. So things are going back to normal, and so we're kind of settling back in. It's flatlined a little bit to slightly down since it's uh, um, second peak there in February. So we need to know people's strengths and we need to know their opportunities for improvement. We have to go back to making sure that we provide specific positive feedback. And we always use the pen, 10 uh, penny trick, right? Where you load 10 pennies in one pocket and every time you have a piece of positive feedback for somebody, you take one penny out and move it to the right pocket, left pocket, right pocket all day long. The goal is to get all 10 pennies in the other pocket by the end of the day. And some people have gone as far as to say, my goal is to do it three times a day. So you have to catch people doing things right, not just wrong. Because then when you catch them doing something wrong and you've provided a lot of positive feedback, it allows them to um, take that negative feedback and not paralyze them. If you give no feedback, it is paralysis for people. who have got to give them positive and on, at times negative feedback on how to improve performance. And we're back to those basic management skills and leadership skills because it's expected nowadays. And we have to be making sure that we use reward and recognition. And that doesn't have to be monetary, uh, although it can be. It can be just you know putting their name on the board with a star by it and saying, great job for doing such and such. And then celebrate every day, daily celebration. So you have to, you have to let them know and show that you care. So it's really important to provide people extra touches because if you provide them extra touches, they are way more likely to provide your guests extra touches. And that is the environment that we're in right now. I don't know about you, but I can tell you that I am so utterly disappointed in how the industry has gone backwards since pre-pandemic. Service is terrible. People don't care uh, as much as they did pre-pandemic. So we're in a different era right now than, than we have been, much more like the 70s. Uh, than the you know 2020s. So we need to kick it back into gear. We need to show people how much you care. We have to create a great service scape for our people. That's your job as a leader, is to create a service scape for your people that is every bit as enticing and lovely as you want them to create for your guests. You have a toxic environment, they're going to create a toxic guest experience. You have a loving environment, they're going to create a loving experience for your guests. And that's what you want because you got to get them to come back, right? Remember 60 to 80% of your sales are going to come for the same guests over and over and over. If you have a lot of travelers come through, it's a little bit lower. If you have a little enclosed like an island, it's a little bit higher. So you're going to get the same people coming back over and over and over. Those are the ones you want to make sure that you're touching and you want to make sure that you're converting those new guests. And you do that by loving on your people so that they love on your guests. All right, this next piece I have preached so many times, uh, but I'm never going to give up on it. And it's really training people to understanding. And this is something that I learned from a, a guy in W.C. Wells that was the president of Tommy Bahama years ago. And he told me, Rick, people can forget what they know, but they never forget what they understand. You'll never forget how to tie your shoes. You'll never forget how to brush your teeth. But you'll forget the periodic chart. You'll forget things that were you thought were uh, important to know at the time, and then your brain says they're not important any longer, and it sheds them. So that's the way our brains work. So we have to train people to understanding. That is understanding why they're doing the job. And the first place we have to start is we have to define and record processes as SOPs. I get the call all the time. I want to put in this uh, piece of uh, inventory software. Okay, well, tell me about your inventory process. Well, we don't really have one. So that's just going to waste the be a bunch of wasted money. You have got to have great processes first, not great technology. Terrible processes produce terrible results, no matter what. So define and record all of your process. And I don't care if it's uh, if it's uh, how you fold the napkin, how you put the fork away, but define everything and how you're doing it. It was one of the biggest pieces of work that we did in one of my past lives to standardize everything. And it made it so easy to run the restaurants and so much more consistent restaurant to restaurant. After you've built those processes out, then you have to have a great system behind it with consistent execution. 
So you have to execute those processes that are laid out. You have to systemize and execute, then layer on the technology. Technology is not the answer. Technology will improve a great system, may improve a great system, I should say, but most of the time it does improve a great system. It makes it easier, it should be quicker, you might get better results out of it. So technology is last, not first. And we always wanna put technology first. So it's processes first. And that's the painful part because it's a lot quicker to put in a piece of technology than it is to define a process. But I'll guarantee you, 100%, you throw technology in, it's not going to work without great processes and great systemization and execution of those processes. Now we're at the point where we need to clearly define all positions and expectations. And it doesn't have to be this gigantic bullet pointed list, but you need to clarify, define all positions in, in the workplace, server, buser, so on and so forth. Make sure you have good job descriptions and then position plans for your managers results driven. So we have got to create structure for managers. I've seen way too many times where we hire a manager and they fail. And that's really expensive. It, it sets back, it's, it's often thought that it sets between six months and a year of salary back when you lose a manager. It's very costly. And we've got to get structures for everybody. Hour one, hour two. Don't let them wander around. Don't let them create their own structure because they're going to run to what they want to do rather than what needs to be done necessarily. So it's really critical to know that people are inexperienced to that manager level. So handing them a piece of paper of here's what you do the first hour of the day. Here's what you do the second hour of the day. Now there's going to be anomalies that come up, but by and large, you can define out what their structure is. If it's a nine hour day, if it's a 10 hour day, what are you doing each hour of the day? Because I think way too often we have managers that are just filling shifts. That's all they're doing is filling shifts. They're not accomplishing work. They're not driving results. They're just filling shifts. And we can get way more out of people if they have a clearly defined schedule structure that shows them uh, what to do every day of the week. Without fail, results will improve. If you don't have it, they'll wander around and fill shifts. And, it, and that's our fault as leaders. Then we have to teach all staff how to manage labor, not just the managers, but all staff, and especially the kitchen. You know, we just yell at them and tell them their labor's too high, their food costs are too high. And I'm going to reference that again later because I'm very passionate about it. And then make sure you post your results every day. So you can see that chart down below. I know what's expected of me at work 48%. That's darn near an all time low of knowing what's expected of me at work. So it's on us as leaders to teach and train and develop people. Which brings us to the next piece, which is Rudy Mix saying, of, you have to know, you have to do, you have to teach and you can master. So we have to realize and recognize that we have to move every team member through competency to mastery. And that really starts with they, everybody when they start a new job, they're somewhat unconsciously incompetent. Then they move to conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and then unconscious competence after that. So those are basically unconscious incompetence is, I don't know what I don't know. And if you look at uh, that last chart on Gallup, when it talked about, I, I, I don't necessarily have what I need, need to do my job, or I don't, I don't know, uh, that's really unconscious incompetence. And you can see that number was 48%. So half the people in your restaurant don't even know what they're supposed to do. They don't know what they don't know. We hire a, a server, but we don't clarify the expectations of what we want that server to do. We just hired a server. We hired a bartender. We hired a manager. We hired a cook. They should know what to do. No, you can see half the workforce doesn't know what to do. And they want to succeed. You know, these people are, they're unaware of the expectations that we have of them. They're unaware that they've got lacking skills, you know, and they might even deny the usefulness of that skill. So it's really the first stage is telling people very clearly what they need to know because they don't know what they don't know when they're unconsciously incompetent. So it's our job to move them to the conscious competence stage. So the conscious incompetence is the next stage, which is I know what I don't know. So 
I can't quite do it yet. I'm aware that I have a skill gap. Um, I know I need to improve. I just need help getting there. So at this point, they commit to learning and practicing, and they um, commit to getting to that conscious competence stage. They want to succeed. And then they get to this conscious competence uh, area, and they can do. So know, do, teach, master. They can do at this point. So I can do what I know. Problem is they need to concentrate. They need to think about it. They may not be on automatic. They can't do it with their eyes closed. And they're probably unlikely to be able to teach people um, how to do it. So we want to make sure that, that they practice, practice, practice to get from stage three to stage four. And that's really to be unconsciously competent. And that is, I can do it with my eyes closed. The problem here when you can do it with your eyes closed is eventually if you do it too long, uh, you may be intolerant of uh, other people's weaknesses. Um, so it, it, it's really, it's second nature at this point. And sometimes that's hard to pass on, but this is our goal is to get them to this piece. So now at this point, they're the know, they're the do, they're the teach. And the last piece, it's really the mastery. And that's, that's, that last piece is when you are so confident that you wake back up to knowing your confidence, that you can do it with your eyes closed. So that's the last, the mastery stage that we want to move people to. So we, they, they start as a novice, they end as an expert and as a master. And at that point, they're ready to take on something new because if masters, one thing about masters, by and large, they will begin to slip in their performance and spend more time covering up their lack of performance than performing. So we know we have to bring them new challenges. That's why it's important. If they want to get into management, we identify them early and we move them along that track. So now we're on to labor staffing. And staffing is different than scheduling. Staffing is really planning, making your pan manpower decisions and operating guidelines. I remember years ago when uh, I was working with, with uh, a new client and we put in these blind staffing grids and the light bulb went on because all they ever did is write a schedule and they let people come in, you know, according to the schedule and what they needed. So that's an operating function. That's, it decides who works where and when and what tasks they're going to do. But manpower uh, staffing is really, here's what the business needs. And that's how you should staff your restaurant, not who can work where. That is the Achilles heel of our industry. Oh, if I, if I don't do this, then I'm going to lose these people. Well, sometimes you might need to make a different decision or you're going to bleed red and eventually a decision will be made for you. So we want to get on to staffing first. And that's by blind staffing grids. So we do these once a year. You build out a minimum grid and then you build that program by day. It's a very time consuming task, but very well worth it. So you're going to want to build it based on the size of your organization in five to ten thousand uh, dollar increments and then that tells you how many people you're going to want to have at each increment so for example if i need uh let's say three cooks to do five thousand dollars i might only need four four and a half cooks to do ten thousand dollar increment so building that out it has to be built out by the hour of the day and then you that sets your labor ideal stand, schedules uh, standards for scheduling. Then you can match up your schedule to that, where you can go in, you can say, okay, we're going to have a $50,000 a week, or in some cases, maybe it's a $20,000 a week or $100,000 a week, but the grid is already built out. So you say, here's what I should be running, how many dollars I have to spend. Then we write a schedule that costs out to that amount so that we're matching up the cost of schedule to the blind staffing grid. And then we can look at what is our forecasted goal for the week, that determines how many dollars we have to spend that determines the schedule that we can write um, and we review all of that together and then we use a checkbook to manage it so this last piece in red here i skipped over it so you know i'm really big on making sure you get the business in front of you if you're constantly looking back if you're constantly not planning which is the achilles heel of planning organizing staffing directing and controlling the achilles heel is the planning side we have a lack of planning so make sure that you plan the business. You have to get the business in front of you and plan it. Then you can drive results. If you don't do that, you're going to just be hanging off your life. So how do we get this labor into action? 
we forecast sales and costs every day and we make adjustments to the schedule. One of the best operators in the industry always told me, because I, I always marveled at his labor numbers. And I, how do you run such consistent, great labor numbers? He's like, I write my schedule at 80% of the forecast. So write your schedule at 80%. Then he's like, look, people will stay extra if you need them to stay extra, but they're not going to uh, they're not going to go home early if you're writing fat on the schedule. So schedule that productivity because his, his opinion, and I agree with it, is that we're at a minimum between 20 and 40% unproductive. Restaurant, the restaurant business has some of the most unproductive metrics for measuring performance of any industry in the world. So manufacturing, boy, they got it down to how many you know bottles of milk you're going to produce uh, per minute. So uh, and how many people it takes to run that machine. And it's that way on the manufacturing side, but restaurants is all about people and we, we, we don't have those same metrics to live up to. So his opinion was we're at a minimum 20% overstaffed at all times. So I write the schedule at 80%. And his numbers, believe it or not, front of the house, still right around 10%, actually a little bit lower. Back of the house, still right around 10%, maybe a little bit higher. If it's still running 20% at the most, uh, direct labor without management. Uh, we want to make sure we have short, fast, energetic, profitable ships, shifts that optimize our operation. And then we manage that by a checkbook. How many dollars did I have? And how many, how many um, dollars did I over or underspend? So what was the schedule? And how did I uh, line up to that schedule? So we want to make sure we kind of shift at this point to focusing on labor sales per labor hour in the front and the back, not just percentages, because as minimum wage goes up, those percentages get a little bit wacky because um, we may raise the pricing, but it may not be directly uh, correlated to what the labor should be. So we want to make sure we're driving more sales per labor hour. And, and in a lot of cases, guests per labor hour, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we want to make sure we're driving efficiency rather than percentages and that for the front i would say 150 dollars uh, for total sales uh, and you're going to look at your numbers to start um, and you may be way below that or slightly above that uh, or blowing it away but you need to look at those metrics um, and then 140 dollars for back of the house food sales per hour and then use every tool that you have to manage every hour of every shift and every dollar. So this next piece I think is very important because we want to have producers and not sluggers. So sluggers, sluggers are, you know, they, they, they just slouch off all the time. So we want to make sure we have producers and that uh, brings up an example to have producers only. I uh, went to a restaurant um, recently in Bellevue, Washington, and there's a lot of them there now, and there's a lot of really great restaurants there. And so we went in uh, for dinner, and the dinner shift as as we're kind of uh, later in the evening. They had three servers on the floor. Fantastic. They had two managers in the back. They had two expos in the back, standing on the other side of the line. They had three bussers. They had seven people in the kitchen while the servers have 10 table sections. And oh, by the way, I forgot to put on there two front of the desk, uh, front of the uh, front desk people. So look at all the people they have to support those three servers. Um, and then they had a bartender or two, but it was the worst staffing model I think I've ever seen. And we have to look at what the floor looks like. It's gotta be a pyramid with the producers, uh, really an inverted pyramid with the producers, which are the servers and the bartenders, have the most staff, and then it filters down to any kind of support staff because servers can always fill in and line cooks can always fill in if need be for those support positions that they have to. And managers can always fill in for those support uh, positions. So we need to repurpose the support staff. We just can't afford it anymore with minimum wage creeping up to 20 bucks. It just doesn't make any sense to have somebody standing at the front desk. So they have to be cross-trained on how to deliver food how to bus tables, how to get away from that front desk, but keep an eye on the door. The bussers and the runners, I think ultimately need to be converted to servers. So 
Uh, I know that some of the POS systems with the handhelds have helped improve that kind of staffing model at the server level, but I'd still rather have somebody spending the table uh, time at a table um, as a server than I would have a busser come along and remove the plate. I think servers are more than um, capable of bussing their own tables. Uh, so having, you know, four servers and one busser as opposed to four bussers and one server, that's the model. So we need to be very, very careful and make sure we don't have a lot of support staff because they're very expensive and they're, they're, they might bust their butt for a period of time and then be slow because um, they can be fast, but we, I, we want more revenue producers on the floor. Same with DISH, same with PrEP. They know everybody needs to be a, learn to, to jump up on the line to help out. As well as the guests in the building, it is all hands on deck. And then we have to teach and train again, mentioning this, we have to teach and train the kitchen staff to manage labor and food costs. We have to teach them, spend the time, sit down with pen and paper and show the kitchen sta staff how to manage labor. It's way too often that they're just told their labor cost is too high, the food cost is too high. And on the labor side, they feel stuck because maybe their people have two jobs and they can't you know, say, well, if I give you know, so-and-so these you know, hours, then they're gonna go away. Um, so at some point, they're going to go away anyways. The restaurant business is very transient. We have to run it around the business and not necessarily around the people. And that's a tough pill to swallow. If you do run it around the people, just know, hey, I'm spending an extra $30 a day just on this one person. That's about 11000 bucks a year. That's my investment in these people. But know those numbers if you're going to do that kind of thing. And then make sure that you match your hours to the peaks in the business. So really, really fat in the middle and skinny in the shoulders. Fat in the middle, skinny in the shoulders. Take risks before the rush and after the rush, but not during the rush. Productivity is always greater than percentages. Productivity drives profit. So we have to manage every hour of every day. Go back to the beginning of the presentation where we talked about people need to be directed and what they're doing. We need to be bossy right now, pleasant, but bossy because people don't necessarily have the experience. They're gonna slow down, they're gonna stand around. So we need to make sure that we have every hour of every day managed. So busy opening, busy closing, and don't be afraid to schedule at odd times. So a lot of people are like, oh, I brought them in at four, I brought them in at 3.30, I brought them in at 4.30, brought them in at five, whatever it is, don't be afraid to schedule somebody at 3.45, 4.15, 5.15, 6.15. .15. Because a lot of times I see the staffing of most restaurants is fully staffed for dinner right around four o'clock. Like, what are they gonna do? Or might have a busy happy hour, but certainly not busier than dinner. They so waste two or three hours worth of time every day that adds up you know think about 50 bucks a day how much that is about eighteen thousand dollars a year so it adds up so we want to watch speed as well what is what is the speed of people you don't want them rushed you want them fast so we watch them we make sure their movement is fast and efficient but not rushed manage those sales per labor hour we keep you know we want to make sure that we keep people in bodies because it's hard to find people and recruit right now. So we want to keep bodies, but we're going to use what Terry and Broyles says is use that 15 minute sandwich. So cut 15 minutes on the front, cut that 15 minutes on the back and do that all day long. So use that 15 minute sandwich to really closing the front and the back of the shift because that's where we always lose it. It's, it's clockwork every day. That's where we lose it. So profits automatically going to follow productivity. Becoming productive is the most important thing for labor management of anything we do. It's not labor and uh, managing labor percentages or labor dollars. It's managing productivity, and that will give you more profit. And for the kitchen, that's really small menus, easily executed with properly portioned items, which is the number one sin in most restaurants. They don't portion everything and running a really tight kitchen. Because your responsibility as a leader is to get the maximum productivity with the absolute best results possible. And the metrics that you want to manage on a daily basis, and this is just some, and maybe more that you like, but you got to manage the in and out times. You know, those little seven minute 
early clock ins? Was there a business there? Um, or did we waste it? Make sure your POS, if you can integrate with your schedule, shuts people out from clocking in without you clocking them in or give them a variance of five minutes or something along that line. So we wanna make sure that we manage in and out times, forecast accuracy, check your numbers all the time. Are you a great forecaster? I'll guarantee you the best forecasters in the industry run the best numbers in the industry, bar none. Best forecasters get the best results because they know how to schedule, because they know what they should have and when people should be working. So forecast accuracy, you wanna measure that all the time. Schedule versus actual hours, that's a no brainer. How much did I schedule? How much did people work? Um, we wanna manage labor dollars and labor margin. In other words, how many sales per hour were worked? We wanna make sure that we spend labor, dot use labor. We wanna know what the sales per person are, both in the front and the back. Did we waste any money? Line those up. One of the worst days of the week, in every business is Thursday. Go back and look at your numbers and see if your labor is worse on Thursday. Sometimes it's even worse on Friday because we overstaff. So that goes back to forecast accuracy, making sure we have the proper forecasts uh, to run the proper labor. Uh, we wanna manage those ticket times, make sure they stay in line. This is a lot of work to manage this stuff. I realize that, but this is all really important. And, and after you have great process, and you've systemized to execution, you can put in a piece of technology that'll give you these things pretty easily. Um, table turns, how many turns are you getting? When are they doing it? What days of the week? Um, manage and I guess check average. And lastly, I had to throw in this, your break compliance. Make sure that you are watching that break compliance like a hawk because there's a lot of life lawsuits lying around right now. So we want to make sure that we communicate the results. After we've done all that measurement, we summarize the results, we post it daily, not weekly, every day. We want to know what, what we're supposed to run, how did we run. Then you can summarize, summarize it by the week or the period or whatever you want to do, but make sure it gets posted every day so that people are looking at those results every day. So continue to clarify role responsibility, provide timely feedback, dedicate adequate resources for development, uh, pay attention to how work is structured. You know, is it structured properly? Uh, especially at the management level. That's very important. And then for the third time, invest in kitchen training in food and labor management. Don't just tell them the numbers are too high. And lastly, you want to recruit continually. What recruiting does when you continually recruit, um, you basically send a message to your A-B players that C's are going to get washed out. So make sure that you have standing interview times that you're constantly recruiting. Don't stop recruiting. Always look for that bell ringer. Someone's going to come along that may be better than a C player. Because if you think, you know, look at 30% or 20 to 30% of your workforce are Cs, you're going to want to replace them or they're going to quit or worst case scenario, they drive out an AB player because they think, oh, these guys, they don't even know what they're doing at the management level. I let this person work and they shouldn't be working. An A, B person would rather pick up the slack than work with a C. So always be recruiting. And then you have to, right now you have to move really fast to hire. Every day I hear, you know, um, I got back to them a couple of days later and they're no longer available. So you wanna to get to the people the same day uh, as when they apply or some uh, people have a shorter time as an hour of getting back to someone um, to get them into an interview because what's happening a lot of times is I scheduled three interviews. Uh, one person showed up late. One person didn't show up at all. One person showed up um, and was actually good. But we're in a tough spot where people are just ghosting interviews. So we want to make sure that we're recruiting continually because you can't count on much more than a one out of two luck ratio. Unless you're super awesome, one out of two if you're lucky. So one out of three is more typical. I hired three people, one of them worked out, the other two were duds. So we wanna require, recruit continually, um, always be recruiting. And remember that retention beats recruiting that goes all the way back to making people, uh, make sure that they understand their jobs, what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to be, what time they're supposed to be there, the expectations. So 
they feel really great about their job, they feel secure, uh, and they can perform. Just in summary, we want to make sure we engage first. We want to make sure we train to understanding. We manage and develop people. We plan labor, not react to labor. We manage productivity actively. We continually recruit and we win every day because your people are looking to you and saying, how can I win today with this person as my leader? And that is a question that people ask every single day when they come to work. How am I going to win with you as, as my leader? All right, questions. All right. I got to tell you, Rick, you, you can always get the most requests for replays. They, people are wondering if we're going to show this <laughs> later. And yes, we are. We will have this up on our website later today and along with the slideshow. So you can look forward to that later this afternoon. Um, we do have a question. Is there a is there a general direct labor, labor percent of sales goal for family fast dining restaurants? Yeah, you know, that's really shifted. It used to be in the teens and then it went to about 20. I still love it around 20, but you're going to be getting a great result uh, provided you're a Washington-based restaurant and not outside of Washington because you can do better with the tip credit in 43 other states. So uh, in Washington state, the low 20s is actually a good number for direct uh, labor now, um, unfortunately. Uh, so labor numbers have pushed you know, into the mid 30s, which means we have to put a lot of pressure on the cost of good side of things to keep those in the 20s. Uh, great great uh, beverage cost, great food cost uh, to offset that little bit higher labor cost. So I know it's really hard, it's a lot of work, but if you plan it out, it will come to fruition because you may have to, when you go through and you do these blind staffing grids and you plan out the hours of the day, you can see these hours are duds. I mean, these are terrible. We should not be open and don't be afraid because people check their phones before they go anywhere. It wasn't that way pre-pandemic, but now everybody checks their phone before they go out or they even open on Tuesdays. So. Um, I think be be very conscious of the business and choose the business first. All right. If you are opening a new restaurant, how far out would you schedule interviews? Two weeks, three? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, I think that you have to be scheduling interviews a minimum minimum of four weeks out because if they have a job already you want them to give two weeks notice if they don't give two weeks notice that's not a person you want so i'd say probably six weeks out a uh, minimum of four managers you got to start a couple months ahead of time there's long lead time there uh and then you have to structure it like hey you know you've got a job here's the package i want you to come in you know two three weeks early uh for training and helping the interview and all of that kind of stuff but Ownership needs to take a much bigger role now in interviewing for a brand new restaurant uh, than they have in the past because you can't afford to hire the staff and let them you know, sit around for a month and be trained. Some of the big chains can do that, but if you notice, most of the big chains are not in Washington state. You might have a onesie twosie, but by and large, uh, the big chains are in other states where they have the concentrational locations. When you are talking about labor percent goals, are you including benefits and taxes? On the direct operating, no. The direct operating is just kitchen uh, and just the uh, front of the house. But the total number is with benefits and labor. Yes. And I'd still love to see that work really, really hard to get into that low 30s. 32, uh, if you're super busy, you can actually get that number into the 20s because your management as a percentage of sales comes down um, because you have, you know, managers fixed. So if they kick out more numbers, those numbers will come down. Uh, but on the other side, big restaurants tend to have about a 30% load on labor. So if you do the math, if you run a 25% and you've got, you know, 30% uh, on top of that load on top of that, you're going to run low 30s, 32 and a half or so. So that's why we need to keep pressuring and make sure that we've got uh, great staffing at the crew level. What's the best way to pull third-party sales from Uber or DoorDash by time of day into sales reporting? 
Uh, this person struggles to get their arms around the total business by hour with 50% of their sales coming through third party. Yeah, I think you have to work with your third party provider to make sure you're getting the accurate data. Um, if your POS is not compiling that data correctly. Uh, but we, we know by and large, they still come in. People eat at dinner time, people eat at lunchtime. So we know those times of day typically are more uh, filled with uh, third party delivery than any others. And that's why a lot of people struggle to keep them on during that time. But it's like, you know, I'm not going to order um, over at eight o'clock. I'm going to order at six or 5.30, something along that line. So the POS, uh, if it doesn't track when that ticket is executed, then you need to go back to your vendor and ask for uh, that data because they'll have it. They'll definitely have it. And sometimes you can log on their website and get it as well. Um, this person has been having a higher than normal turnover for bussers. In a server to busser ratio, what's the normal or ideal? Yeah, so I really like maybe maybe one to four maybe one to four um, i do not like to get above that um, i'd rather have a ton of servers pulling the vast majority of their plates and then a bus are kind of wheeling around and and uh you know finishing off cleaning tables um, sweeping maintaining those you know the floor and everything else um, but i think by and large you know if you keep your section small one busser to take, you know, 16 tables. Um, it's a lot of work, but they can definitely do it, especially if, if you have a superstar and make sure they're paid really well. Those bussers, if you have a great one, uh, they're worth a lot. And somebody else is going to see it and try to, you know, hire them. Uh, bussers and dishwashers right now, a uh, super high turnover rate. All right. Do you have any industry labor numbers that you can share for hotels without restaurants? Uh, hotels without restaurants. Mm -hmm. um, not sure what that, that means. Hotels that don't have restaurants. Yes. Um, I'm a restaurant guy. I know what they should run in the restaurant. Um, but if they don't have restaurants, then I, I'm not sure. If I don't know, maybe it's being managed by another party. Um, the, if they're being managed by another party, they should be virtually identical to run in a restaurant. For example, um, let's say that you have a Tom Douglas restaurant in a luxury hotel. Those numbers, unless the hotel is insistent that things are done a certain way, for example, you have to have breakfast and it's not busy at breakfast, um, by and large, they should be very close to the same numbers as a regular restaurant because they're, they're getting fed all of those sales and they're getting the out you know, they're getting the outside sales coming in as well. Do you foresee any return of the tip credit in Washington state? Do I foresee that? Yes. If you ask, if you ask Anthony that question, uh, he would say it's always a non-starter. Don't even bring it up. It's always a non-starter. We bring it up anyways, but no, there will, there will be no tip credit. I don't think ever in Washington state. It's one of seven states. In fact, it's kind of starting to drift the other way where states are like, why, why do we give credit for tips? So I think you're gonna see more of the service charge model coming forward in the future. I think we're gonna to have to go that direction, like you know, Europe where there's no tipping and you just have a service charge in your uh, check. And then that gets distributed appropriately to the staff. Uh, still a big fan of that. Um, I wish we could figure out how to do that as an industry without kind of cannibalizing each other because it's always a wait and see. Everybody says we're going to do it, and then they let one person do it and fail, and the other 29 win. But it works, by the way. It works. We've got some absolutely stunning numbers using service charges. Stunning. All right, this question comes from someone who owns a small takeout restaurant with a staff of 10. Their schedule is pretty much the same year round with what feels like the barest staff they, they can get away with. Any advice on smarter staffing when hours can't be trimmed around the edges? Mm. That's a stump the van question. Um, it really will have to be working the overlap at the beginning and the end. 
So taking risks at the beginning and the end of those shifts, that's when to do it. Uh, but you know, not obviously not in the middle. If you need if you need three people uh, at lunch during the busy time, you're not going to be able to get away with less than three people. Um, but it's the start time that gets you and the end time that gets you uh, in those scenarios. All right. Well, that looks like all the questions we have, Rick. Thank you so much for taking the Absolutely. time to talk to us today. Absolutely. My pleasure. We do have one last one that comes in and then we'll go ahead and call it a day. Um, I think the tip credit they were referring to specifically was um, in those states where um, restaurants can have a lower minimum wage for those yeah. employees that are. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was speaking to. There's no, yes. that's not going to happen in Washington. Yes. Absolutely not. Not going to happen. Minimum wage would be 30 bucks and we still, they still are not going to care. doesn't matter. It's just not, you know, we, we live in a state that is very pro-worker and um, that's just the platform and it's going to stay that way. Absolutely no way it's coming back. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, we will have this up on our website later on today, along with the slideshow. Um, and thank you again to our sponsor, Adesso, for sponsoring this webinar today. And thank you, Rick. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody.